Um, I'm thrilled to introduce Peter Green, who is a graphic designer and photographer residing in downtown Providence. Peter documents peregrine falcons and other urban raptors from red-tailed hawks nesting on a rusty fire escape to American kestrels hunting in graffiti-covered alleys. His wildlife photography has been featured on the American Kestrel Partnership website, published in the Providence Journal, and exhibited in United States Senator Sheldon Whitehouse's uh, Washington, D.C. office. His first book, Providence Raptors, documenting the lives of urban birds of prey, which I was going to grab and show everybody, but our copy is checked out currently, um, was published in September 2020. Um, so we're just really thrilled to welcome Peter. So I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you for having me, Caroline. I appreciate it. And thanks everybody for joining. I'm happy to see familiar faces and new faces and blank names on fa <laughs> no cameras, but uh, I hope you enjoy it. So um, like she said, I'm a graphic designer. I work downtown. Uh, when I moved downtown into this loft, I didn't care about birds much at all. But outside my window, I see the Superman building as it's known. And up there, there's a nest box that peregrine falcons like to use. So it was about 2009 or 2008, I first saw some people on the building with waving broomsticks around. And I didn't know what was going on. I thought they were kicking the falcons out. So I gave a, a call to whoever I could find. And Audubon Society told me that US Fish and Wildlife does the banding of the falcons every year. So I asked if I could attend. And they said, well, you've got to wait another year. But if you call us back in a year we'll, and you're still interested, you can come. So that was 2009, my first year up there. And, and I was just hooked on watching the Falcons since then. And um, I just had lots of photos to tell, but I really liked to tell them in a story, not just showing a particular picture. I like to tell the story. So I started a blog, ProvidenceRaptors.com, where I would share these stories. And then the social media kicked in as well. And I started to work with Audubon and people who rehabilitate animals. And it's all just snowballed into this wonderful hobby of photographing and talking about urban raptors. So as we're talking, I could probably see a falcon fly by. So I love where I live. Um, and I'm going to dive right in and start talking about the falcons and, and, and hawks and other animals as well. And like I said, if you have any questions, unmute yourself or I will keep an eye on the chat. Uh, so let's see, I'm going to share my PowerPoint. Screen. All right, so hopefully everybody can see that. And that's my book, Providence Raptors. Like I said, it's available at the Westerly Library to check out or um, other libraries or lots of stores in Providence and Rhode Island or on my website, ProvidenceRaptors.com. And it's full of 200 pictures, all taken in Providence, Rhode Island. So. That was the rule I set for myself. This book is only about Providence Raptors. I could have talked about some other birds and other parts of the state as well, but only downtown Raptors in this book. And the stars of the book and the rulers of downtown are the peregrine falcons, uh, the fastest animal on the planet. They use gravity to get to speeds of over 200 miles per hour, almost reaching 300 miles an hour. And they're recognizable by their really black and white colors and the mustache uh, sideburn type of look. I, sorry, not mustache, sideburns look like um, the similar to the uh, football players put black stripes under their eyes to block the sun from their eyes. That's why that has evolved in the Falcons to keep the sun from reflecting in their eyes. And like I said, I love where I live. I take a lot of pictures right out of my window. So this is a shot of me photographing the Falcons. And I'm really lucky every morning I wake up, I see the building and by now my eye has memorized the outline of the building. So I can wake up and see there's a little falcon right there and there's a falcon right there. So I can see them pretty much every morning, even if they're just a speck. And so as I got into them, I would upgrade my camera, you know, and um, I was always into photography, but never into long range zoom photography. So it's been a learning experience there as well. So at first I got a 300 millimeter camera where I could zoom in about this much. And now I could zoom in with my 600 millimeter all the way up to the top of the building. And that's actually the tallest perch in all of Rhode Island. So when they're up there, they're on the highest point in all of Rhode Island. And it's cool to zoom in to these urban raptors. I start to, to learn about carvings and things on the buildings that I never knew before. So here's a beautiful eagle carving up on the building that the falcon is flying past. 
So the box is, is placed right here. The box was installed by Mr. Joe Zabrowski, who's uh, attending today. And so basically, if I got this correct, the you know Falcons were almost wiped out of the East Coast because of DDT, a, a pesticide used in the 50s and 60s. And that made all their eggshells very fragile for all raptors. So especially the falcons suffered. And eventually that was outlawed. And um, uh, groups like the Peregrine Fund and falconers, they bred falcons and they released them in areas on the East Coast to repopulate the East Coast. And they naturally live on cliffs. So they're high above their prey down below. And so by the time they were released in the eighties, we had skyscrapers up, which basically mimic, mimicked these cliffs. So they would show up on the skyscrapers because they love the height and they'd hunt all the pigeons in the cities. So they would show up in New York and they showed up here in Providence. I but if they would try, when they make a nest, they don't use twigs like hawks or other birds do. They scrape into the concrete or they, not, they, they scrape into the cliff. But if they try to do that in the concrete, they can't do that. So they would lay eggs on concrete or bridges and the eggs would just roll off. So eventually boxes were placed, usually where the falcons selected the spot already themselves. So this box meets all the requirements required for the placement of a box, like good drainage from rain, faces east like the falcons like, it's, it's enough height, it's 30 floors high. The building's hopefully not gonna get knocked down in the next 10 years. I mean, when it was placed up, it was doing well, but now it's unoccupied. So uncertain state of the building, but, um, those are issues when placing a box. And luckily the Falcons took to the box in the year 2000. And since then it's been occupied and producing babies every year. So from my window, you know, I first would start to see these pigeons flying around in flocks like you do. And you say, somebody probably spooked, somebody's feeding them somewhere. But I eventually realized that in that flock, there's a, a usually a Falcon above or below driving them crazy. So when I see the, the pigeons go nuts, I grab my camera. And then the falcon might grab a pigeon, right, fly right past the window with the pigeon in its, in its talons. Now the falcons catch prey on the wing and that refers to catching them in flight. So they'll just grab a bird that's flying by or they'll kind of punch it and knock it out and then swing back around and catch the bird as it's falling down. So they're really fast, really aerodynamic. And so when uh, they start pairing up in, in springtime, early spring, they start sharing food with each other. Normally they're very solitary animals, but they do pair up. So the signs that they're flirting is they'll be sharing food. And you know, like, it's just, it's crazy downtown. You know, you can see the blood dripping down the building here. It's, it's fun for me to see this outside my window and imagine what's happening on the street below. Like, do, are people getting blood and feathers thrown on them? And it's just fun. Nobody else in the city seems to realize what's happening above them. Uh, and you know, like I said, here's all the feathers blowing in the wind. Uh, so for example, here the feather, I mean, the falcons are over here on the right and there's a worker on the left in this yellow jacket. So you know, he has no idea there are two peregrine falcons eating lunch next to him. So it's fun to see that kind of stuff. And you know, I, I always see them from afar, but once they showed up, one showed up right outside my window. So that, that was one of the best days for me. The falcon was right outside my window. You can see it has a dove. And this falcon showed up, I think three years ago, and you can see there's no bands on this falcon. So it's unbanded, we don't know where it came from. So most of the falcons we see here that are adults have been banded in Massachusetts, just because we're surrounded by Massachusetts. And, um, but the past years we've had unbanded ones. So sadly, we don't know exactly where they came from, but personally, I think it's, it's, it's okay because it's a good sign that falcons are rebounding in the wild and there are nests that scientists don't know about or are inaccessible and they don't ban them but it's okay that then there are falcons doing well but as far as i like to do a breeding chart you know keeping track of all the adult birds together each year now that they're unbanded that might be hard to uh continue anyway so if you're downtown they love to sit on the corners of buildings and the biltmore sign is a favorite of theirs because they love to hunt the pigeons downtown so uh you know, over the years, I've met managers of buildings, and one year I finally got to go up on the Biltmore and photograph the bird from the Biltmore. So that was one of my favorite shots because when they're on the building where they mostly live on the Superman building, they call it, I can't 
get that building in the shot as well. So, it, you know, cause they're on it. So in this shot, at least the, the building's in the background. And I just love all my shots to have no trees in them just to show how urban they are because it's, it's concrete, steel, red paint, metal screws. Like I love this shot and just the beautiful bird, the aerodynamic shape. Uh, so that was my book cover. And like I said, I'll, I'll follow these birds with my camera and end up seeing lots of cool architecture and learning ab about uh, things that's called a mascaron up on the Biltmore Hotel. And this Peter, is over on the Dorrance building. Peter, I have a quick question yeah. about the, sure. um, the boxes they put up. Do you know, is it yeah. the same birds that come back every year or is there a way to tell? Well, if they're banded, we can tell. So usually they are banded and we can, so I think I have a chart later in my presentation and there's one in my book that for the past 20 years, I've tracked all the couples. Uh, like we had this male for four years and this female and they had this many babies. Um, so I've got all that scientific info, but since this pair is unbanded, like you see this female has no bands in the picture I'm showing now, we don't know where they came from. And it's possible to band adults, but it's somewhat dangerous because if you try to grab them with a net, um, they could get injured. And if they injure their wing, then all the babies won't be taken care of. So it's, it's pretty much not worth the risk. I know that there's one nest in Boston where to get into the nest, the bird actually like flies in like a tiny little hole in the building into the nest. So they actually can just put a, a bag there and she flies into the bag and they grab her and they keep her there while they band. And then they, they think they banded her one year or, or one of the males they banded. Um, so, it, you know, a lot of people say when you do Providence Raptors, like, why didn't you do urban Raptors and talk about it in general? And my answer is because I live in Providence. I see these birds every day. I can't show up in New York City and, and know all about the birds. Like, I know all about these birds. So I know where these birds bathe. Like, when it rains, it collects water on the lip of the Dorrance building. So you, you see the splashing. They go there to bathe often. And when it rains, actually, this is this was uh, one of their favorite rain spots. So especially the past few days, as soon as it starts raining, and it's funny because even though the falcons have switched, they all figure out that that's a good spot to hide from the rain and wind. So these these mascarons are on all the top windows of the Biltmore. So it's great when it rains, I could peek, and they're usually sitting up there. And I just always keep my camera with me. One of my tips for urban wildlife photography is to learn where the public parking garages are because you can go up to the ninth floor and take some pictures and then, and then leave. You don't have to park your car there. So um, there's one near the Falcon. So I always, like I said, I always have my camera in my bag. And if I see them up high, I could go up in a parking garage and get some nice shots. Just, this is just, you know, on the way to the post office. I don't have to go birding every day. It, it, it just happens in the city. You just keep yourself aware and you could see them around the city. And uh, the city birds, like these falcons, they stay all winter because the food stays. So it's really all about food. Migration of birds is all about food. If you eat fish and the water freezes and you've got to go south where you can get the fish. So like I said, the birds, they start flirting with each other by sharing food. So that's nice to see. They'll actually hand it off to each other in the air. They'll sit next to each other, which is really cute um, because like I said, they're normally solitary animals. And then they'll start flirting with each other. They'll, the male will start digging a scrape in the gravel. So you can see there, he's dug, dug a little indentation. Now with all these raptors, the females are one third larger than the males. So if you look on the left, the females, that's the female, she's bigger. And in other pictures, we'll be able to see that too. But it's cute, they flirt a little bit together and I'm gonna play some video here for you. You know, normally you just see these birds flying, killing things, eating things. Um, so to see them in private tender moments is very special. So, you know, there were a few times I went up to the building just to capture these. I don't bother them anymore once I've captured these moments, but you see they bow to each other and they chirp to each other. And I find that very endearing, especially for a foul, like with these claws, you know, something that, like I said, is just known for, for killing. So I'll, I'll show you, they, they bow once again. It's very cute. And then they'll be mating all over the city. So, um, and you know, one thing about birds to keep in mind is, you know, people say, all right, falcons have five eggs. So they can have four or five eggs, three, four or five. So how do five eggs fit inside of a falcon, right? 
Well, that's that's not how it happens. They don't get pregnant. You know, one, once the guy who works in the building said, oh, I think the bird's pregnant. She looks big. You know, they don't get pregnant. So what they do is they mate one day and then the next day an egg comes out. Then they mate another day and then another egg comes out. So it happens every other day. And then when all the eggs are laid, she'll start incubating them. So they all will hatch around the same time. Um, other species do it differently. I believe owls start incubating immediately. And sometimes you'll have ones hatch before the others, which the bigger ones might eat the, the smaller ones. If, if they incubate all at the same time and hatch, they end up all, even though they're laid every other day, they end up all hatching almost on the same day or the next day, usually within 48 hours, they all hatch. So you can come downtown, use binoculars. You can see the birds flying in and out of the box or watch on the webcam. So now, now Audubon has a webcam on and it's really popular. People around the world um, are watching. So in this picture, you can see the female is on the right side. Uh, and there's a shot with five eggs. You know, they've got these beautiful red eggs and there they are one day old hatchlings and that egg hatched the next day. And I got these great close up. So when they eat, they line up. Normally they're in like this fluffy pile and you can't really see how many there are. So it's funny with the webcam, once Audubon put it online, they didn't anticipate how involved some people would get. So one of the funny stories is one year there were three falcons and well, well, I'll tell you in general, sometimes people call and they say, you know, I haven't seen the mom in three hours. Like, where is she? Is she dead? Somebody's got to go give those babies some chicken or something, please. But, you know, they have to understand that it's they're wild animals. We're not going to interfere. And the mom is probably out hunting. But there was one year where all the babies, like I said, sleep in a pile and they line up to get fed. And so that's when you can count them. And somebody, people were calling and saying, you know, there were three in there and now there are only two. So um, I got the call, I went up there to see what I could find. And yeah, there were two in the box and unfortunately one had fallen out of the box. So I looked over the edge and it was sad to see it like that. And, you know, I thought it had definitely perished, but, Luckily that leg twitched a little bit. So I said, all right, I gotta go out there because I've been up on banding day many times. I know how to quickly get around the corner. You, um, so I went around real quick, grabbed the baby, put it in my bag, turned around to leave. And the mom was there blocking my exit. So she had seen me arrive. So I just had to shoo her away and she went back to the box. I took the baby out inside and, and it was healthy and alive. So that was really wonderful to see. Now, if you just look, it's got a really sunken in upper chest. Uh, these birds have something called a crop up there. So it's like a, a pre-stomach almost storage area where the mom can feed them a lot more than their stomach can handle. So their crop will get nice and filled and then that will go down into their stomach. So he's basically crying to be fed. He has not been fed in a while. So I called the Wildlife Rehabilitators Association of Rhode Island, which has now been rebranded re as the Wildlife Clinic, and I redid the logo for them. So there's a little shout out to them. They're a great organization that you can call if you have an animal that's injured or orphaned. Uh, so this guy was injured or he needed to be fed. So I gave him, them a call. They heated up some quail. I put him in my cat carrier, brought him down to the clinic, and Ariana fed him some quail. He was really happy. And there you can see now his crop is all filled up. So he's nice and full and he's not crying anymore like to be fed. So it's just like a real baby. Feed me, feed me. And then once you feed them, they're ready to go to sleep, take a nap. So that's the door we take, we come out of on banding day. So the box isn't on the very top. And uh, you might see there's a famous guest with us that year that was Senator Whitehouse. And we had a reporter from NPR with us. And we walk around the buildings we all wear helmets so we don't get scraped and attacked and punched in the head by the uh, parents who are very aggressive. But as long as we stay against the wall, we're safe because the, I always say the falcons don't want to jump on you like a lion and tear you apart. You know, they just want to fly past you and punch you in the head. So if you're against the wall, they're going to fly towards you and then quickly away so they don't hit the wall. So as long as you're against the wall, you're pretty safe. Uh, so here's Joe and there's the box and the falcon doesn't know that there's a secret back door on the box. So she's always surprised when Joe climbs the ladder. And there she is. Oh, who the hell are you? So Joe's there. He's got his helmet on. He wears the same jacket every year and it's got lots of scars on it. So you'll see um, 
sometimes they get him in the back. So there they are, the Falcons. So they'll yell and scream, but it's an urban legend that if you touch baby birds, the parents will abandon them. So they're, they're happy to get their babies back. If a baby robin falls out of a nest, the, the mother just doesn't have the dexterity or the power to pick it up and put it back. So if you put it back in, she'll be happy to have it back. And so they just keep an eye on us the whole time. Um, they attack the brooms instead of attacking Joe. So that's what the volunteers hold up brooms and mops to keep Joe safe. But once in a while they get him. So there's, there he is hitting the back. Now these falcons will do to us what they do to their prey, which is if they're gonna attack a duck, they will fly towards the sun and then directly at the duck. So if the duck thinks there's a falcon around and it's looking around, it will be blinded by the sun. So that's what it does to me as well. So I'm trying to photograph it and it goes right to the sun and then directly at me. So it's a um, difficult challenge as a photographer, but after these years, it, it, it's fun and I'm able to get some good shots like this. And you know they don't normally fly with their talons dangling down like that. That's to show us their weapons while we're up there. They're normally much more tucked in and aerodynamic. So they're showing us their weapons exactly. Here it is again. And you know, the banding day is my favorite day of the year. It's the one day I can get close-ups of these birds. You know, they stay up on the building, and this almost looks like studio lighting to me. With you know, and it's even got some, you know, leftover food on its beak. But yeah, that's the day I can get these great close-ups. You can see the falcon has a little notch in its beak called the tomial tooth. Now that has evolved to specifically decapitate the prey that it eats. Now that's kind of gross, but think about, they eat a lot of birds, they eat a lot of woodpeckers. They're not gonna, they don't wanna swallow a gigantic beak. So when we're up there on banding day, we find a lot of heads of things they've eaten and we can categorize what they've eaten. Uh, lots of flickers, lots of woodcocks. I even found a, a kingfisher head on the ground. Um, let's see, so, you know, I get these great shots. So if you see at, the, at three weeks of age, their feet are already huge. They're already the size of the adults. So the feet grow first and the rest of the body catches up afterwards. So you don't have to worry that the bands are gonna grow, the feet are gonna grow and the bands are gonna be too tight. That's always everyone's question. So you can see Joe will take the, the bird, measure the, the, the bird's ankle size and the size of the ankle will also indicate if it's a male or a female. You know, and actually, you know, it's not actually the ankle, it's the tarsus because of the bird's foot anatomy. It's, it's a different part. It's not the ankle, but it's the foot. We could just say the foot. And they get these special bands placed on them. In this shot, you can see the bird has this little um, egg tooth on it. All birds, even chickens get this. It's a little, I think it's calcium, I think. I forget what it is, but something on the tip of their beak to chip out of the egg. And so it helps them pip out of the egg and then it falls off after a little bit. This one still had it after a few weeks. So like I said, the parents are happy to have their babies back. Joe puts them back. Here's the mom on the right, much bigger than the male on the left. Oops. Uh, there's, that's what I look like on banding day. And then they, the falcons after that are very aggressive when they have their babies. Like they will attack any other birds around the building. So here's a red-tailed hawk that had to fly upside down for a second to avoid the um, bird that was attacking from above. So there you can see the falcon came and a falcon on the left, red-tailed hawk on the right. And here's a falcon chasing a cooper's hawk. A cooper's hawk has those really banded tails. And you can see that falcon shape, that point, those pointy wings and that aerodynamic shape the U.S. Army, our Army, has modeled the stealth bombers on that peregrine falcon. That looks exactly like a stealth bomber right there. And so, the, you know, they're very fast. They're fast, faster than my camera can freeze the action sometimes. And they'll chase after larger birds. And ospreys don't even eat other birds. They eat fish, but the falcons are so aggressive. They, they don't care. They'll chase everything away. Turkey vultures, they'll attack the giant turkey vultures. All right, now check out how fast they grow at 10, at one week old, that's the size. And then at just six weeks old, they already look like adult falcons. So they're just in their juvenile plumage. And it kind of reminds me of pigeons. You know, people say, why don't I ever see any baby pigeons? It's because they're not like little ducklings that follow their parents around, little versions. They, by the time they leave the nest, they are the full size of the adults. And they just look like brand new cars, brand new versions is what I like to say. 
Um, so, you know, if, it's fun tracking these birds. So when we had in 2016, this female showed up with her band 63AE, I was able to talk to other birders through Facebook and stuff. And somebody who watched where she was hatched and banded in Lowell, Mass, had pictures of her as a juvenile in her plumage. So you can see the difference in plumage in, in her muscles development. And it, it's just cool to see. And when they leave the box, I always say like, um, it's graduation day, uh, but it's also a very dangerous day because they are uh, in these very fast bodies that they don't yet know how to use. So uh, it takes a lot of uh, practice. They flap around. They remind me of little cats. They're getting used to their wings. They're playing around with food, taught like a game. And they sleep a lot like cats. So they'll be up there a lot. And then uh, hopefully in July, you get to see them flying around. So here, the three of them have already made it onto the building. Now, once in a while, one of them will end up on the sidewalk. And that's a, a normal thing to happen in the wild. They're learning to fly and they land on the ground. And so they would probably hop into a tree and hide from predators and then try to fly again and make their way back up. But in, here in the city, we can't leave them on the sidewalk because they'll get hit by a bus or everyone stops and takes their picture. So sometimes Audubon will get a call or DEM. And since I live around the corner, um, I love being the guy that they call and say, hey, there's a falcon down. So they don't have to travel 30 minutes into the city. They give me a call. I show up with my net and my uh, carrier. And I, by now, I know how to examine the bird to see if it has any broken wings or anything. Um, and if it's usually okay, and you know, because they could just hold out their wings and glide down. Like, even if they can't fly and get lift, they can glide. So they're usually okay. And you can see this one I just brought back to the rooftop and left it there. And then you can see the parents came and took care of it that evening. So there's no trouble returning a bird. And yeah, I forgot my gloves that time. And then the flight training begins. You'll see the, the parents showing them how to eat, I'm just how to fly. And they no longer feed them by coming to the birds. They will land somewhere with the food and make the birds come to them to get fed. So um, they'll have to learn to fly if they want to get fed. And like I said, I just keep my camera with me always. You never know where they're going to land. It's fun to get pictures of them in all different situations. And then it's great to get reports from people in other states about our birds. So. Here, June 23rd, this bird banded 85 BD was being taught how to kill by its mother right here. Then by August, somebody spotted it in Wellfleet, Mass. And then, uh, let's see, a year and a half later, it was in uh, Alpine, New Jersey. And this one is one of the best ones from 2009. This little chick has lived in Boston. I think she's still there and has had over 30 chicks. And like I said, now they're unbanded, so we don't know exactly where they came from. Uh, they, one was missing some left wing feathers for a few years, so that was an identifier, but they seem to have grown back. One had a chipped beak, that had also grown back. And like I said, so here's the chart that I have on my, in my book and on my site. So when they're banded, we're able to, you know, I, thanks to Joe and other people, I'm able to get information about before I was watching them. So they filled in the first 10 years and I could fill in since 2009, the different pairs and where they came from. And that's available on my site as well. Right, so that's all I'm gonna talk, say about falcons. And now I'm gonna talk about red-tailed hawks. And if you have any questions for right now, you can, you can feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'm gonna jump into the hawks. Because the red-tailed hawks are the most common. That's what you'll see in the suburbs when you're riding down the highway and you see them uh, on the lampposts. All right, so let's see. Great, all right. So there you go, now, there's a nice beautiful red-tailed hawk. Obviously it's got the red tail. So that's an identifier on the adults, the, the rusty red tail. It's got a, what they call a belly band, which is somewhat like a cummerbund across the front, across the pale chest, you'll get a brown cummerbund. And this is, they have yellow eyes that get to a dark brown. So this is a nice adult bird that's been surviving in the city for a while. Now, you know, I did my book and I have all these pictures, but just like six months ago, I got some great video that was unexpected. So I'm gonna show this video real quick. 
like I said, it's, you know, it's, it's fun, amazing having, um, you know, iPhones in your pocket, you could capture everything. But I just saw the hawk up in the tree, pulled out my iPhone, it was perfect timing. Grabbed one of those pigeons right in front of me. And that's how it happened, you know, that, that's why they're here. People feed these pigeons, I mean, people feed, yeah, people feed the pigeons, they're in a giant flock. He comes down and grabs one and it's easy. I say, why should the hawk hang out in the woods and chase a little songbird through the trees when there are a hundred pigeons sitting here distracted? And like I said, you'll, if you see a hawk on a highway, it's most, a raptor, it's most likely a red-tailed hawk, which is nice to see, but it's, it's dangerous for them. They're there because people litter on roads and then there's food on the highway and then a mouse or a rodent will come out to get that food. And then they're exposed on the pavement. So it's a lot easier to see them than if they're in the grass. And then this mouse will also get caught in those highway dividers and run across the highway and the hawk will come down and grab them. Unfortunately, then the hawk get hits by, can get hit by a car. So a lot of um, hawks in rehab are hit by cars. Once they lock onto that prey, they're going for the prey. They're, they don't really understand that the cars are coming towards them. And, and I like I said, I love the urbanness of, of downtown and, sh and the architecture and just showing that you know they don't need a tree they'll make it they'll use anything as a tree and um so it, you know, it was fun for a while before i got into it i was probably just like this guy walking past the hawks in the tree this you know he's on his cell phone doesn't even notice there's a hawk right next to him but once i started to notice um it's fun to watch them hunting downtown it's like a discovery channel show right here so if you're downtown in the, in the winter time is the easiest time to spot them because there's no leaves on the trees. So obviously you can spot a big white hawk sitting here. Um, there you go, beautiful red tailed hawk. They might have a one foot up once in a while. Some people will say, where's their other foot? They're just keeping it warm so they'll rotate feet. And you know, I just love those talents. They're really, you can see how they're related to dinosaurs with these gigantic reptilian feet almost. And so when I first got into it, there was a hawk that was hunting every single day for two weeks. And since it was cold, nobody else was in the park. And I was able to just go and sit with the pigeons and he would just come right at me. So that's really what got me hooked on it. Like before I was even able to go up to the Falcons, I was getting hooked on watching these hawks. And, and I just couldn't believe I was getting these pictures just during my lunch hour. So it was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, they eat, they'll eat squirrels and rats as well. So if somebody tells me they see it, they've seen the peregrine falcon, eating squirrels downtown. I, I'm sorry, but they're incorrect. The, the peregrines don't eat mammals like that. They, they eat flying mammals like bats, but they don't land on the ground and eat squirrels. That's a red-tailed hawk or a Cooper's hawk. So it's fun, you know, like, like I said, these, the, the pigeons fly through and people don't, aren't aware that there's a hawk flying through them as well. So um, it, it's just, it's a fun thing that's happening in this city that people aren't aware of. But, and then I somewhat have made it my mission to make people more aware of it and then to help the birds by not um, using rat poison and to being aware of the issues with glass. So that's why I've taken upon myself to tell these stories and, and compile it into a book with lessons about how to help the birds. And, and you know, I love shots like these two because look in the background, it's a Riptobus, the Rhode Island public transport. This cannot be taken anywhere else in the country, you know? So this, this shot here, this could be anywhere in the world. It does, well, not, it's an American species, so anywhere in America. But these shots say with Kennedy Plaza and the Riptobus and Trinity Rep, they say Providence. So that's why I, it's Providence Raptors and I tell the stories of Providence's birds and whatever happens in New York, there's a guy telling that story. And I know there's a guy in Boston telling that story and there's a guy in, in every city or, or a girl or a woman telling the story. Um, so you see they'll, people feed the pigeons, they come and I always thought people just fed pigeons extra crumbs, but they actually come with bags full of popcorn and pigeons, to popcorns and, and bagels to dump out for the pigeons. So they'll be in a giant flock, you know, not even looking above them. And the hawk will just come right down and grab one pretty easily. Okay. So this was the crazy, well, no, not that one. Oh, so yeah, though, in the, in the winter time, you'll see on the snow, they're easy to spot. Uh, the blood will be dripping down, it's crazy. You know, you can see it looks like somebody dumped out a pillow. 
And, and it's funny to see the reactions of people. I love including people in the pictures too. You know, the, everyone calls everything an eagle. So you've got to educate people. And one of the most common urban legends is people say, oh yeah, that's the government hawk or that's the government falcon or eagle. And I say, well, what do, what do you mean that's the government hawk? Oh, the government brought them in to kill the pigeons because there's too many pigeons. And I have to explain that that's a total urban legend because, and they go on, oh, no, it's been trained to stay here and every night it flies back to the Biltmore. So these are all urban legends because the city would be much happier to, happier to just poison the pigeons or rats. They're not gonna buy a hawk that could fly to Connecticut tomorrow if it wants to. Um, you know, there are some things where hawks and falcons are used at airports to scare away uh, problematic birds, but these are wild birds. And people even ask me, is that your bird? As I'm photographing it. So it, it's sad that they don't realize there are wild animals living amongst us. Uh, if I get to my uh, owl series, somebody asked me if it escaped from the zoo. And that's his first thought. But I like to get down low, show the angle of the birds. This is a very young bird. You can see with the yellow eyes. The previous ones had darker eyes. And I got great camouflage too. Um, this one, I almost walked right past it. I took some pictures and then when I got home, I realized uh, that is the foot of a seagull. So it wasn't eating a pigeon that day. That's a webbed foot. So sometimes there's a pigeon or a seagull is coming to get like the free bagels as well. And again, it's just fun to explain to these people. It's a wild animal. Um, they're always like amazed what's going on. It's a, it's, and I, I still feel that amazement as well. It's right here. This, you can see the falcon opened up the pigeon's chest cavity and pulled the heart out. There's the heart with the ventricles. <laughs> and here, so, you, so like I said, they eat rats as well. There's the rat tail. Now, when you think about these birds killing something, you think that they're gonna stab it with their claws or they're gonna kill it with their beak. Now, I would say their unseen hidden power is, is their crushing force. That's how they actually kill a lot of the time. So if you can see this hawk landed on this giant rat with both feet and crushed it. If it just landed with one foot and just tried to catch it, not crush it, the rat would turn around and bite its feet and it would be bleeding and there would be a fight. It has to kill it as quickly as possible. And it learns the hard way. It probably got bit once in the past and then, and then learned how to, you can just see the both feet at the same time. So that was crazy. And then after it flew away, it flew away with this rat and, and that rat tail almost hit that woman in the head. I remember, so I went up to her and I was like, did you feel something fly past your head? And she's like, yeah, was that a pigeon? And I showed her the picture of a, uh, this gigantic rat that flew past her head. So you never know what's flying past you in the city. And, you know, I've watched them so much. I, I have dream shots that I beg them. Can you please land in front of that hawk, in front of that flag one day? All right, thank you. Now, please go land in front of the Rhode Island flag, please. And eventually after a few years, they listen to me. And it's fun to see interactions with the squirrels. And, you know, there's so many pigeons downtown that these hawks, these are two different species of hawks and they're, they're in the same tree because they're like, all right, well, there's enough food for both of us, no big deal. Um, there's a red, blurry red-tailed hawk in the front and in the background you see a skinnier, smaller Cooper's hawk with the striped tails, uh, with the striped tail. So they both hunt downtown and they normally chase each other around because they, but in this case, they were like, that's cool. And I love doing the blog because people call me with tips. So if I have a follower who's downtown and they see a hawk, they, they text me or something. So these are some neighbors of mine and they said, hey, there's a hawk on a car downtown in a snowstorm. So I went and got some great pictures. And then people ask me for advice and I'm always happy to help. So, you know, this hawk was trapped in a parking garage downtown and they were asking me, here, should we get it out or should we just leave it alone? And I said, you know, definitely get it out because it reminded me of a story where a guy said he worked at a department store at like Home Depot or Lowe's. And he said, a hawk flew into the building and they decided to name it. And they were so happy they had a pet hawk now living in Lowe's. And then after two weeks, it, it was dead on the ground when they showed up. And he's like, what do you think happened? And I said, well, it starved to death inside of Lowe's. Like, what do you think it was eating inside of Lowe's? It was trapped in there. It didn't live in there. It was trapped. So they should have kicked it out. Um, glass is a big issue downtown. You know, we've got a lot of bus stops. When I first moved in, they were not glass, but 
they installed these glass ones. Um, and I asked why they did that. And they said it's because people defecate inside and people do their illegal drug deals inside and they, the cops need to be able to see inside. So unfortunately we've got to have these glass bus stops. They put stickers on them to break them up, but I've gotten contacted by people waiting for the bus who said a hawk just smacked into the glass. What should I do? Luckily, if they don't break their neck, they fly away and they're okay. Here was an instance where it hit the reflection and you can call DEM, uh, expert will come and assess the bird and see if it's okay. Uh, another instance, this is a story in my book where this is the arcade, a downtown shopping center. And there was a hawk trapped in the arcade. They don't know how he got in, but he was up on the ceiling. And I was able to get nice pictures, but he was way out of reach and we, you know, we wanted to help him out. So I'm gonna show you some video. You know, he was just way out of reach and, and I, this wasn't an injured bird that you can walk up with a net and capture it. Anytime you tried to approach it, he had like the whole mall to fly around in. So eventually, let's see, eventually he landed here and then they gave them that had, that gave them a good idea. So what they did to get him out was that night they turned off all the lights. They there's see this glass area over here. They put wood over all that glass to block it. And they got some spotlights and lit up the exit door. And so the only thing illuminated was this exit door. And then the next morning the hawk was gone, so it flew away luckily. All right, that's Cooper's hawks. And I'm going to jump into a, another series. Um Let's see, I was gonna be either owls or kestrels, but I think I'm gonna do the kestrels because I just love these little kestrels. So let's see, I can share this. All right, kestrels are tiny little falcons. They're only about this big. You know, in, in general, the size of these raptors goes falcon, then hawk, then eagle. So eagles are huge. These little kestrels are very small. Hold on one second. Here's a Here's a carving of a kestrel. So this is an actual size, actual size of a kestrel. It's not taxidermy, it's a wood carving. So it's actual size, very little birds. Eats little mice and little birds that are too small for the peregrines. So they live downtown, They like I said, little mice, little sparrows, starlings, dragonflies they eat. Um, I'm gonna get into what they eat, you'll see. But they're really cute falcons, and they're one of the only uh, raptor species that are sexually dimorphic in terms of color. So you can see the male and the female look different in terms of color. This is the female on the has who has rusty wings on her on, on the sides, and the male has blue on the sides. And their tails are also very different, and you'll you'll see that when I go further. Now, if you're looking, they love antennas. I mean, anytime I see a kestrel, it's on an antenna. So look on antennas and wires like that if you're looking for these birds. You see them in trees sometimes. Now this shot I like, you can see the females on the right and she's also a little larger like with the uh, peregrines. And this shot, you know, it's funny, you know, I, I love always showing uh, the birds on, in the urban environment, but this one always reminds me that through DNA analysis recently, it was discovered that falcons are actually more closely related to parrots than they are to hawks and eagles. And I think when you look at this picture of kestrels, you can see that they are like little little murder parrots, people say, you know, they're colorful. They've got the small little hook beak, not, not the big gigantic beak. And so for many years, I was watching kestrels downtown, but I would see the adults and their offspring out in July, but I never knew where they were nesting. They would show up, I would see the mom feeding the babies on a billboard downtown. So I knew they had to be around the billboard somewhere. And I would check every tree. They're, they're like peregrines where they don't build a nest. They, they nest in a cavity. So they would be in a dead tree or, or something or a, a hole in a, somewhere. But I, like I said, I was getting great shots. I, and here's a, one of them downtown all the way up on the top of the building pretending it's a peregrine. And I would see them mate, but I did not know where they were. So, okay, one year, it starts here. Well, this was a great year. I think it was 2014. So I saw this shot. And th this shot, you know, it looks just like four birds, but there's a lot of information in this shot. This bird is looking directly at me. That's the mom. These three are looking at her because they want to be fed. She's all disheveled because she's been sitting on eggs, taking care of them, hunting. 
and she looks, you know, she's got to get her hair done. They look like brand new, straight out of the factory bird. You know, like, not a, you know, perfect. So these are brand new fledglings, all looking at mom to be fed. And you can see this is a female, this is a female, and that's a male. So one day I was watching her. After she fed them, I, I almost had a heart attack. She flew directly at a brick wall. I thought she was going to hit the wall. She flew right into this vent at full speed. So after three or four years of watching these kestrels, it, I was like, voila, this vent that I've been walking past every day is where the nest is. So um, it was just amazing to be able to then go and sit in my car and in the air conditioning in the summer like, and, and treat it like a blind as if I'm in the forest and just roll down the window a little bit and get shots of these kestrels coming in and out of the vent. Now, the craziest thing was she was going in and out of the vent without any food. All her babies were already out of the, of the vent. So I didn't understand what was going on. Why was she going in and out of the vent? Here's, here, now you can see this is the female's tail with um, very rusty with black stripes. And this is the male's tail with has the one thick black stripe on the bottom. So they were going in and out of the nest without any food. And so I, I spoke to an ornitho ornithologist at the American Kestrel Partnership. And I said, why would the mother be going in there? She said, maybe she's hunting, maybe something else is nesting in there and she's hunting, but she's, she never came out with any food. Um, and then she said, you know, maybe the mom is just going to take a break and it's like tough being a mom. I was like, it's not a human. It's like, it's a bird, you know, she's not gonna go take a break. So I had to figure out what it was. And, you know, so I got permission from them to do this, but I, I say, don't go, don't go sticking your cell phone into um, bird's nests. But we had to see what was going on. So I got a little ladder, I stuck my phone in there. And it just happened to be that that, that day that I did it was the day that her second clutch of eggs had hatched. So, so that meant she was taking care of her babies out in the real world and also incubating eggs. So that's why they were going in and out of the nest. They were incubating eggs. And then when I looked, they had just hatched that day. You could see the eggshells. Um, and then after that day, she was bringing food in nonstop to feed them. So that was hatch day. Um, a week later, they were already fluffy and you could see getting big feet. Just two weeks later, you could see that the, they've already had these blue wings indicating that some were male and female. And then, like I said, here we go with the foods. And you know, people ask what they eat. The, the answer is everything. So here's a, with a little sparrow. And notice, there's a lot. Of, uh, sorry to say, but there's a lot of decapitation. You know, they they decapitate the birds and and the the mice. There's a mouse. Oh well, no, there's the head on the mouse. I could see the teeth are still on there. Uh, there's a little bumblebee or something. That I learned was, is a tomato hornworm. So uh, I also learned that those come out in August. So this was definitely a shot taken in August. More sparrows. And then, you know, that's what I was waiting for, to see these adorable little faces finally peeking out of the net, out of, out of this vent. And, you know, how, how much more urban can it be? You know, it, it's just great. And they got the little peach fuzz on the head. And again, by the time they're they're out, they almost look like the adults. And it was just adorable to be able to watch them. And then to like pose in front of the graffiti, God, it was just crazy with with the vent in the background. This is one of my favorite shots of all. Like this baby had just come in out of that vent. People say this is like his rap album cover. You know, he's like tough guy with the graffiti. I, I love this shot. And it's funny because. I didn't anticipate that he was going to be out. This is how, this is, it's not the best quality. It's with my cell phone because he was like too close for my big lens. So I didn't have a small lens with me that day. So yeah, the other shots, I eventually like had to like jump all the, stand a lot further away to be able to zoom into the bird. And then it makes the background blurry. So I, I prefer this shot, but uh, you can see it. I, you know, and they look like a dinosaur, look like those little vel velociraptors. And you know, then there's sitting on the table underneath. It's hard to walk away and leave these birds to go live their life. I want to make sure that they are okay and don't get hit by a car. But um, you know, somebody who is going to go eat their lunch at that table and not know that there's a bird underneath it. And you know, they'd be sleeping in the corner like babies. But I just had to let them go. 
And eventually, you know, they would climb the wall I saw. And eventually they make it into the trees. And once they make it into the tree, they're pretty safe. The mom knows where they are, they can chirp and, and the mom will feed them. And like I said, they, they look brand new at the end. Here's a brand new male, here's a brand new female. Uh, it was fun, the Keschel partnership then ended up using one of my photos from that in their calendar. Now, the one interesting thing was if when I look, first looked in the Keschel vent, there were all these twigs on the bottom of it with the, with the babies inside. Now, a Keschel wouldn't have brought those twigs in there. So I think something nested in there before the Keschels, and it was probably a starling. And a starling is an invasive species that is causing the, the decline in the Keschel population. So here's proof of it right here. The following year, this starling was bringing nesting materials in and out of that nest. So it kicked the Keschels out. Um, there are a few other locations I watch Keschels, like they're in private houses, like this person does not keep their house up. So up in the corner, there's a hole and the Keschels nest in there. And I go on my bike to watch and I be careful. I don't want to tell the family who lives there that there's Keschels in their house. I don't want them to see me because I don't want them to redo their roof or think that they're like a nuisance pest. So I don't even tell them about the Keschels. So that's my secret. Right, so that's the end of Kestrels and I see I'm running out of time. So I think I will just show you one more video that I made. Um, you know, I, I do lots of photography of hawks and falcons and you know, that's a common, those are common species in all cities. But let's see, two or three years ago, a barred owl showed up downtown and to have a, a wild owl living and hunting downtown was just so amazing for me. And that, and the series of pictures I got that's what really convinced me that I had a could do a book that was worthy of being read. You know, it had interesting stories because the owl was definitely unusual. I say, you know, if an owl was hunting in your suburban backyard, it hunts at night and it would be too dark to watch. But in the city with all the lights on at night, it was like a movie set lighting up the hawk. I mean, the owl flying and catching rats. So I really, in addition to photos, I really needed to take video. So. Um, I put together a three minute video of this owl and I'm going to share that as well now. Let's see. See, I just, you know, again, I just love it. There are all these ice skaters there. Nobody knows there's an owl watching them. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, you know, every night I would go out, I'd say, where's the owl gonna be? And it, it was just always an amazing surprise. It would be sitting on these signs, really urban. I, and in the daytime, if you see an owl, it's usually asleep, so it's in one spot and you get a picture of it in one spot. At night, you'll see this was, he was active flying around like I had never seen an owl before, alive, walking around on the ground, constantly in action. It, it was amazing. He didn't care about the sirens, he didn't care about the buses. And at first I would go out at midnight and assuming that's when an owl's out, eventually, I. It was winter time when the sun goes down at 6 p.m. As soon as the sun went down, he was active when people are still waiting for the bus. So it was fun. I know the, that fountain is surrounded by rat burrows. So he basically would just wait by that fountain, you know, and I would say, please land on the fountain. And there he did. And he was there for about three months. So during the snow, like I said, during the day, he's sleeping. I could get some beautiful close-ups like that. Here I showed up, he had already had a rat. He's gonna fly right past me with the rat dangling down.
Now this is fun. You can see him, he's gonna fly right past me and then you'll see my friend was standing next to me. And so she got me and the owl in slow motion. So that was, I, it's amazing. Right here downtown, I, you know, I go hiking to try to see an owl and I never see one. And here's one downtown, it's crazy. Landing on the flag of Rhode Island. So it was a lot of fun. And then you see the rat, right? He, he would sit on the benches and he was so docile. It was almost like I was invisible. If, if I tried to make him see me, he, he would not see me. It was like I was invisible. So yeah, th this was one of my favorite little bits where I got the, enough pictures that I liked and then I just sat on the bench and enjoyed sitting with him. All right, I think that's a good place to end. All right. So thank you a lot. <laughs> thank you. Does anybody have any questions or? I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. You know, I say, please follow me on Facebook, Instagram, whatever you use. Check out my site, pick up my book, please. Um, I'll be talking at Raptor Weekend in September at Audubon where they have rehabbers bring in injured birds so you can meet birds in person and all that fun stuff. So uh, maybe I'll see you at Audubon. Is that up in Bristol? Yep, that's at Bristol. Peter, I have a question for you. Um, okay, Nancy. Have you seen the herons down by the pedestrian bridge? Yes, they're exactly. Yeah, you know, I just did a kayak tour. I teamed up with uh, Providence Kayak to uh, lead a tour and talk about any birds that we saw. So yeah, you'd notice they, they have like some floating separator in the water to, I guess, keep some debris from floating into the main area of the water. And it's created a little cove and on that barrier, there are like 15 herons and 20 cormorants just eating fish all day. And so they've been flying by downtown too. And like, yeah, there's been times I grabbed my camera to try to get a shot of, of a blue heron in an urban environment and that would be cool. Um, but yeah, that's fun to see. And you probably know when, if you go to Home Depot in Seekonk, there's a, a heron rookery there and you get out of your car and it looks like pterodactyls are flying over your head. Thank you. Cool. All right, anybody else have any questions? You know, next year I would say watch the webcam. Uh, they turn it back on in spring. Joe, do you have a, are you trying to talk? I gotta unmute you, I think. Let's see. I gotta, I gotta unmute Joe over here, one sec. Uh, ask to unmute, there you go. You got a button you can press over there to unmute you? Uh, I can't, we can't hear you, Joe, you've gotta talk. You got to unmute yourself if you want us to hear you, Joe. I can't hear you. Oh, there you go. All right. How many different owls have you seen in the city, Peter? That's the only one ever. Uh, you know, it, you know, it's funny. If I had, a, if you guys want a little more, I mean, I could show you some more. I have an owl presentation where, before I saw the owl, other people were seeing the owl and texting me pictures, and it was really fun to see. Like, it was at the arcade. And then somebody went to see like a hockey game and it was over there. So it was flying around and I wondered if there was more than one. Um, there was definitely, you know, that year was a big year for barred owls in general, because there was definitely one here, definitely one in Wayland Square and one on the west side. And, and also the rehabbers received like twice as many barred owls, not only in Rhode Island, but all over New England. So I think like 2008 was a big year for barred owls in general. But yeah, so Joe, then it eventually started hooting in February, you know, looking for a mate and then it, and then it left. Um, yeah, it would have been great if it stayed, but I've also found, well, Joe knows about this, I found the remains of barred owls under the falcon's box. So it's, not, it's dangerous for an owl to be here with peregrine falcons around. You know, the falcons rule and they don't want to share basically. And they have, they have like a, a territory around. So, People ask, why don't we put other boxes up on the other buildings so we have more falcons? But they wouldn't tolerate each other. They would fight to the death. So, so yeah, that's I would love, you know, there could be a screech somewhere, Joe. I don't know. I mean, there could be more Kestrels I don't know about. I, I would love to see a screech. We put a Kestrel box up on my building to try to get them to 
uh, nest downtown, but eventually I realized it's too high on the eighth floor. They like to only be about 20 feet off the ground. Anybody else have any questions? All right, well, thanks again for having me. I appreciate you all coming. Thank you so much. That was really awesome. Really enjoyed Excellent. that. Very interesting. All right, and, you know, again, the video, if you want to watch again, is on YouTube. And feel free to contact me with, with any any birding ID questions that you, if you see a bird on the highway, I'm always happy to answer challenging questions. I found right. a bird recently and Peter helped me get it um, to safety. It was a baby bird along the side of the road. Do you remember what species it was? Um, yes, Casco. <laughs> a grackle. 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 Uh -huh. And uh, we brought it to a, to a, like a wildlife place that took care of it because we didn't want to risk whether or not the parents would still keep feeding it. And I'm glad we did because originally they thought it was just a day or two too soon from the nest. But when we brought him, his tail was so short, his or her tail, mm. that they said it would have been at least two weeks. And I don't feel like those parents mm. would have consistently fed him and, and another right. animal could have gotten him. Yeah. So that was a good choice. Yep. Yeah. And it's funny when they get the little baby birds, sometimes at that age, you can't tell what species it is. You have to wait another week or so until some more feathers come in. She knew the species, but not is. the gender. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you can never know the gender because unless they're different colors or if you do a blood test or with the raptors, you could tell by their ankle width, but a little you know, cardinal is, but uh, I, I don't know. Can you tell the difference between a male and a female robin? The sparrows you can. Grackle, I think they both look the same. I think, the, uh, Joe, tell me, any difference between a male and female grackle? I don't think so. You know, I'll tell you about something very um, surprising. You know, I, I, I saw a grackle decapitate a sparrow downtown. I, I had never heard of that behavior before, a grackle eating a, another bird. I thought they ate like insects and stuff like that. Peter, yeah. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, do they tend to come back and to, to nest in their the areas that they were, their, they were born in? Yeah. Year after yeah, that's, year. A good, that's a good question. You know, one of the best parts of the chart that I made is that it shows one of the offspring left and for four years and then came back four years later. And by that time, his mother was gone and his father had a new mate. So we, you know, the joke is it's like Young and the Nestless or, or Falcon Crest, the soap opera, where so then the, the son came back, kicked out the the father, his own father, and then mated with his stepmother for a few years. So yes, they, they, they'll come back. Um, you know, this is prime real estate. It's the tallest perch in Providence. So they want it, everyone wants it. They, there are other ones pass by and there's fights in January for that spot. Um, when in New York City- When do they, like, yeah, go ahead. I would just say in January is when usually other ones who aren't paired up start to show up and break up, try to show up, break up this pair. But I was going to say, you know, I, wa I watch all the nature shows. I love stuff like Planet Earth. And, you know, there's a new one about Planet Earth, about New York City. In New York City is the highest density of peregrine falcons anywhere in the world because every building is a cliff. There are millions of pigeons. The nighttime is lit up so they can hunt at night if they want. And it's just nonstop diving in, you know, and, and opportunities to nest. So um, they tolerate each other a lot more there and because of the abundance of food. And uh, like I said, according to them, it's the highest density of, pop of peregrines anywhere in the world right now. Do you ever have many, ne many nests on, on one building or do they, are they very No, like I said, they, they, exactly. They would, they would not allow that. They fight to, they would fight and kill each other. There's like one pair allowed. And usually their territory would be like a mile or two or three miles. But so the closest nest that I know about right now is at Pawtucket City Hall. So that's the, I think three miles away maybe. Yeah, and when do they start to nest? Um, is it usually the same time uh, every year? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's like oh, it's like the same week. It's like they have a calendar. It's amazing. Like even the birds that migrate even come back on like the same day. It's like, how do they know it's a leap year this year, you know? But um, yeah, it's usually April, I think they start laying the eggs. They hatch in May and then we ban them in May. And then by June, they're out of the box. So it's usually April 
is when the, the camera gets turned on once the eggs are laid. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Any, you have any? Yeah, sure, Nancy. Share a, um, an anecdote about Peter. A few years ago, I think it was, <laughs> you, I think you still have it, a fabulous t-shirt with all raptor feathers on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so beautiful. And I bought well, one. Well, thank you. Oh, uh, well. Sent it to my son in New Jersey, oh. and he was curious about the names of, you know, which birds they were ah, from. Okay, cool. So I sent him your email address from the website, and he emailed you. And within minutes, I think you got back oh, yeah. with a listing of all the birds. You were very well, impressed. well, I'll, you know, I'll open up my site real quick, and I'll share the link. You know, that's a it's actually a shirt that I designed. I'm a graphic designer for a living. So um, let's see, I'll sh I'm going to share my screen real quick with everybody. Um, so here's my website. Yeah, there's if the you on top, if you click up on t-shirts or on that. So here I, I, have, I have a design uploaded on a site. So here it lists uh, the species here. Oh, it does. Red-tailed hawk, peregrine falcon, bald eagle, cooper's hawk. They're not all local because we don't have like a immature golden eagle here. But you know, it, it's just fascinating to me that these all functionally serve the same purpose. They're all tail feathers. So they functionally serve the same purpose, yet they're all dramatically different colors. So it's just, I love to think about the evolution of them and why they're different and how a male got a different one than a female in one species. Why does a white stripe on this one make more sense than a red stripe on that one? Um, but yeah, it's fun to sell. You can order this shirt in um, any style and color and stuff you, you want to, I guess sweatshirts only come in one color, but uh, you know, there you go. And you can you can change the image and, and you can have some fun. So yeah, that's available through my site if you're interested. So yeah, thanks. I usually wear that, but I, I'm enjoying this new logo I made for the wildlife clinic. So I've got this one on today. All right. <laughs> All right, well, you know, thanks again. Thank you. Uh, you Thank know, you very much. Great. All right. I appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Peter, and thank Bye. you, everybody, for coming.